That time of the year has come around once again. I'm once again a part of the annual series organised by Edge, known as Paleo Rewinds, which is where an array of science content creators of varying backgrounds and sizes come together to document some of the most notable paleontology descriptions and discoveries of the year. I'm, like last year, covering the month of September, continuing on from Nature's Compendium who covered August. After each creator involved has uploaded their video leading up to December 31st, a compilation video of all of the parts leading up to then will be uploaded on Edge's channel, so be sure to be on the lookout for that. Discovered from Lower Cretaceous rocks in Spain, a new titanosaur named Garumpa Tyson was described from remains located in Morella, which were found to clade within the Sumphospondylans, a group which includes the titanosaurs among the largest known sauropods, as well as their close relatives, excluding the Brachiosaurids like Brachiosaurus and Giraffe Titan. One of the more basal members of the group, this new genus is known from good remains, with three individuals being known of, with two complete and articulated feet being found, which is very rare in the geologic record. The sauropod fauna of the region during the time they lived, which includes both northern Laurasian type animals as well as southern Gondwanan forms, shows that an interchange of animals from these two regions was indeed possible and happening, which is quite a bit more impressive considering the Iberian Peninsula and much of Europe during the time was a series of islands. So, with the addition of Garumba Tyson, this allows for much more important information to be gleaned to better understand the initial evolution of a group of sauropods that would go on to be among the most dominant in the latter part of the Lake Cretaceous. Moving on from among the heaviest of large animals to some of the lightest, an incomplete yet still decently sized rostrum and vertebrae of a pterosaur from the late Jurassic rocks of the Lorinha Formation in Portugal was described, the first to be named from the region. The specimen exhibited some peculiar features such as a spatula-shaped rostrum as well as comb-like dentition which suggested their affinity for being a Nathosaurian pterosaur, a group related to unusual members of the wider family Tenochesmatidae, like the filter-feeding Pterodustro. Named as Lucignathus, pterosaur material from the region was very scarce before their description, with the remains that were known of before often being fragmentary isolated bones and teeth, a testament to the fragility of pterosaur skeletons which were heavily nematicized and filled with air. Lucignathus, based on the size of their rostrum, would have been among the largest pterosaurs of the time, with the known preserved rostrum being about 20 centimetres long, though could well have been larger. Through scaling the specimen of Lucignathus to the related Nathosaurus, the total length of Lucignathus's skull would be a good 60 centimetres long, with them then having an extrapolated wingspan of about 3.6 metres as a minimum. This is all the more impressive when pterosaurs of the Triassic and Jurassic have been traditionally thought of as quite small animals, very rarely having wingspans of 1.8 metres or more, so the description of Lucignathus goes a good way in terms of our further understanding of pterosaur diversity and how they reach large sizes quite early on. Pampaphonius bicae, a large dinocephalian therapsis that lived in what is now Brazil during the Permian periods around 250 million years ago, were a group of animals with both carnivorous and herbivorous representatives, which were among the most diverse of large terrestrial animals when they were alive. At estimated sizes of about 3 metres and weights of about 400 kilograms, Pampaphonius were among the largest of these animals. Known well for their solid set skulls, Pampaphonius was among this group in being a noticeable member though until recently, was only known from its holotype, meaning not too much was known on them. This was until September of this year, when new fossil material from them was described, with a complete skull and some additional bones like ribs and arms being found in the rural area of São Gabriel in southern Brazil. This find is very important, as this skull is the second ever to be discovered from the genus, with it also being larger than the holotype, now thought to be a subadult animal, revealing unique information on their growth and morphology due to the great preservation. It was previously hard to differentiate them from their European relatives, so the more that's known from them allows for more about their proportions and overall evolutionary relationships with other dinocephalians to be understood. The early phases of birds transitioning from non-avulant theropod dinosaurs is quite unclear, owing to the very sparse fossil record of the time periods when this was all occurring, namely the late Jurassic. Thankfully, one new find represents one of the youngest and also among the most southernmost Jurassic avulans. Named as Fujian Veneza from the Tithonian Age of China, this specimen exhibits a range of unusual features that are shared with other stem avulans, Truodontids, and Dromaeosaurs, showing a good degree of overlap. Fujian Veneza is distinct from all other Mesozoic avulan and non avulan theropods in having a particularly elongated hindlimb, suggestive of a terrestrial or wading lifestyle, 
which is in contrast with other early avulins, which exhibit more clear adaptations to arboreal or aerial environments. This is down to their lower hind limb, their tibia, being twice as long as their femur, which is a previously unknown arrangement seen in these types of animals. To conclude this video, I'll be leaving off on a recent paper which talks about trilobites, a very well-known group which is known for more than 20,000 species, with them filling an exceptional array of lifestyles, from burrowers to a planktonic life in the water column. Their infood niches range from being detritivores to active predators, though this has all been based on indirect evidence such as body and gut morphology, as well as attributed feeding traces. No trilobite specimen has ever been found with direct internal contents before, that is at least, until now. This right here is Bohemolycus incola, a rather neat trilobite that lived during the Ordovician periods, and preserved a three-dimensionally intact digestive system, and complete with food too. This specimen provides by far the most detailed source of information to date concerning the diets and feeding mode of their group, with their last meal being identified, and the researchers who described them remarking that they were absolutely stuffed. The gut comprises mostly of fragmented calcareous shells, which along with their lack of dissolution indicates that a neutral or alkaline environment was present along the length of their intestine, which shows that their digestive enzymes were very comparable to living crustaceans and chelicerates. This digestive physiology therefore seems primitive to arthropods as a whole, with Bohemolycus seeming more like a scavenger than an active hunter based on what's been found in their fossilised digestive system. Something that was noted was that the carapace of the trilobites was slightly disturbed in how it was organised, which suggested that the trilobite was in the process of molting before it ended up being buried and fossilised, with living arthropods sometimes using the technique of puffing themselves up to better crack their old exoskeleton so that they can better grow out of it. Another interesting observation that was noted was that the fossil trilobites also showed evidence of burrowing by other scavenging invertebrates, with them trying to get at the trilobite's soft tissue before they were buried, seemingly stopping short when getting to their guts. This might be down to the trilobite's digestive tract having some sort of noxious condition within it that made it not very appealing, even for scavenging animals. All in all, this fossil was an incredible first window into life as a trilobite, and another example of how rarely preserved intact remains can reveal so much about not just a long extinct animal, but also their environment in the process. And with that, I thank you for watching this instalment of Paleo Rewinds, and hopefully you learned something new about the discoveries and all descriptions made for the month of September. The month of October will be covered by a mega freelancer, who you can check out here for their video, with the final compilation video being uploaded on Edge's channel, which you can also check out soon. With that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.